Hi, folks. Welcome to UX Leadership by Design, the podcast by and for UX design leaders. I'm your host, Mark Baldino. Podcast is and always will be brought to you by Fuzzy Math, the user experience design consultancy that brings consumer grade UX to the enterprise. Fuzzy Math delivers award winning digital product design and partners with internal UX teams to augment, grow, and scale their impact. Um, today, we are chatting with Santiago Vatere, who is the Associate Director, I want to make sure I get this right, Associate Director UX and Digital Accessibility Standards of the U.S. Center of Excellence at Bristol-Myers Squibb. And if it sounds like Santiago has a lot on uh, his plate, that is true. Um, during our chat, he gives a masterclass of how to grow and sort of scale and gain credibility for UX Center of Excellence and what the various like stages of the life cycle are. Um, and Santiago is also passionate about digital accessibility. Um, and integrating it into the product design process and covers how he thinks we're really in kind of the nascent stages of what it means to um, deliver products that are uh, products and services that are accessible. So I'm super excited for you to listen. So let's go. Santiago, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good, Mark. Thank you for having me. No, no. Thank Excited. you for taking time out of your uh, out of your busy schedule. I'm sure to to chat with uh, with me and um, excited about our conversation. Um, and I know the enjoy the, the listeners are going to enjoy it. But maybe we'll give everybody a quick sense of kind of background. Um, maybe how you got into UX and maybe your current role. Sure. Um, so, hello everyone. Santiago Vitri here. I lead a UX team at Bristol Myers Squibb, the pharmaceutical in the U.S. I ended up there uh, after completing my MBA. I came. I was born and raised in Ecuador. I'm an industrial engineer by train. I started, after I finished college, I started basically interacting with technologies since my first work. It was early 2000s. I think the internet was a sensation. And I was started with a bank in basically helping them develop their cash management solution. Okay. So at that point in time, there were not big uh, IT teams. It was a couple of developers, an architect, and then what we'll call the support, right? So I was the product owner for the back office, basically. So that gave me a good idea of how technology will influence processes. And it was basically on the ballpark because I was just getting my industry engineer degree. From there, I think I had a lot of ex uh, experience experiences, merging technology into processes. And that took and gave me a possibility to go across Latin America, doing consultancy work, doing that, right? I also got the opportunity to work for TCS, Data Consultant Services. So I had, I would consider myself like a good background doing PM and very strategic work. Okay. Um, then I moved to the US. I completed my MBA, um, Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I think I found them on a, on a career fair. They, okay. I connect with them. They look at my resume and they thought, I think they offered me this uh, pos possibility of joining a development program with them. I joined them. I completed the development program for two years. Amazing experience. I'm very thankful for the company for that opportunity because I was new to pharma. And through those two years, I learned the in and out of pharma, right? And finally, after I had to transition, the company was uh, basically at that point in time development, uh, what it will be 2020 capabilities. So in 2015, the company started of seeing, hey, what, how we can position ourselves to be competitive in 2020. Oh, so at that point in time, that set up a user experience center of excellence and I joined the team and that's how my kind of full experience in UX started, right? I, get a, I got certified by Nissan and Norman Group and I'm currently getting a CPAC certification that is around digital accessibility. Okay. So wait, how, what was the trend? So you did this development program, which is kind of a way for you to get what exposure through a bunch of different parts of the organization and background. And then how did you, how did you, um, how did you get connected to the COE? I get that they were doing sort of um, vision far out road mapping and they built this COE, but how did you like, how did that connection Personally, happened. So, yeah, I I was basically networking to see different roles in the organization. Okay. And I remember that at that point in time, Fred Comfer, who was leading the team, I connected with him. And the way he pitched it to me and what he was, the vision for this, draw a lot of my attention, right? He were talking about a user-centric approach, uh, be more 
research oriented, try to kind of test things on the run, right? Like building the plane as you fly, potentially. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the say here. Yeah. And that caught my attention. And for all, it was the passion, right? I remember I when I was interviewing the role, there's a, there, I had a counterpart there, Mukti Patel, and you can feel like these people were after something, right? And I think we ended up creating something great and it has transcend, right? Now we get into a new reorg and basically the UX function got disbanded into different, uh, I would say verticals. Okay. And the COE at the end ended up with me. And now I'm leading a team in the enterprise architecture and platforms team. So basically now I'm being able to influence our core capabilities that develop websites or portals. Is the COE still a horizontal or is it now verticalized in that area? At this point it's verticalized, but we are providing services across all the verticals because of the connections. I'm so interested in that transition. So it was originally horizontal and then as it got large, it needed to be more specialized. So it went into verticals. Like what was... Because I talk to people about this, uh, clients all the time, like, should we have a more horizontal organization? Should we be vertically aligned? And it looks like there was a little bit of a transition at, at Bristol-Myers. It was a transition. It was at the beginning, it was a horizontally. Yep. And then we, the C, the new CIO decided to create um, verticals. So basically, we specialize and move all the teams that support a vertical like uh, commercialization under one uh, scope. But with the exposure, the connections, the toolkits that we have, we have maintained the, I would say, the current connections, and we are providing a vertical service. Got it. So, you the 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 COE sort of got um, established enough that it was able to to then support the verticals as needed, but it didn't need to say at its current size. It's sort of like you got it was it. systematized at that point. You put it in much better words than no, I did. No, no, no worries. You you, you 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 described it. I'm I'm fascinated with those those tweaks because I think a lot of emerging. Uh, nascent UX teams are trying to get to that um, to that point where they can support a lot of verticals, mostly from like a resource perspective. They don't have the resources to be vertically aligned. And so they're trying to get to that capability. But then there's this question of like, well, how much do we need to do that? How long do we have to support that? Um, how long can we? And it looks like we got to a point that once it was systematized enough, it could be broken down and kind of, you still maintain a thread of connection of UX, but it is more sort of vertically aligned. Correct. I think the I th- the key the key to that equation that you have described, ben, Mark, for me is getting the um, the buy-in and also acquiring the confidence of your stakeholders. Right. Mm-hmm. You show up uh, as kind of somebody internal who's doing UX and design, and they tend to go out and hire big agencies to do the work for them. Right. Yeah. So you are knocking the door, trying to get a foot on the door, and say, "Hey, guys, we can do the same here." Right. And potentially it will be quicker, it will be BMS fight, right? That means it will kind of cutter what we tend to present as a company. And it will be in-house. And that kind of know-how, those resources will stay with us. So at the beginning, we were very opportunistic. I think I got the opportunity to have a small team that I was able to kind of reach out to people, understand their needs, and start uh, creating what we call UX engagements. And after a couple of cycles and the uh, work that was delivered um, from opportunistic and basically we put in the bill, then we changed it to a mold that we were able to allocate resources, either UX researchers or designers to their teams, and we charge back for that. Got and it. that has been a success. And we have been kind of, that is the modus operandi, I would say, since two or three years ago, if I'm not wrong. Okay. That process took two or three years? No, uh, the the I would say the transition from uh, free resources or basically pro bono work to yeah. it takes the, took us a one year I would say. Okay. Okay. Yep. And so you're building credibility within the organization. You're putting the processes in place. Can you talk a little bit more about how you and the team went about you know sort of establishing credi- credibility with folks? Because it sounds like that was the tipping point to having people pay for your services internally. So everyone's clear, you're almost running an internal agency, right? Other departments are paying the UX team as opposed to UX team giving their work for free. So you're getting other people's budget as opposed to creating your own budget. And I'm getting that corrected. But the, but the tipping point wasn't just, we had the services and process in place. It was, we built enough credibility with stakeholders that they were, is it wrong to say they're willing to pay for our services? Like, how did you Correct me if I'm wrong there, and how did you go about building that credibility? No, you are on point there, Mark, describing the journey. Like, to how we build the credibility, I think it will be um, 
I would attribute to three main things, right? One is we always try to measure. I think I've, I'm an industry engineer, so I always have been trying to measure the overall user experience. And it's very complex, right? Um, in the COE, we ended up creating, uh, a, um, I would say, UX measures based on the Google Harp uh, framework. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we use that to measure our internal digital capabilities, in essence, our internal applications, right? With that, we get a sense of how we were kind of uh, providing user experience, and we use that kind of as a, as a, as a I would say, a launchpad to engage. Okay, we saw a capability that's not doing so well. Let's engage with them, right? And what we brought to the table, I think, was not just only uh, a critique on the design, but we considered the user experience in a holistic way. So we brought the tickets, for example, that that application had locked to that call center, where were the feedback for the customers. We we're also bringing in feedback that we collected through surveys uh, to support the Google Fire Harbor Network. We also have an internet site that we tend to upload a lot of information that you can get support from the tools. So we get the metrics of how users were interacting with that. So I would say metrics was key and an enabler to get credibility. And on top of that, I think we follow a design thinking principle, the double diamond. Unfortunately, I would say at that point in time, design thinking was kind of like the new kid on the block. Everybody was using it and it get kind of saturated and people stopped using it. But I think for us was a success to keep doing like uh, we establish a framework and we keep repeating the same approach over and over until I think the stakeholders realized that it was not, I think it's a whole shift mentality on them because, and sorry that I'm a little bit all over the place here, but no, no, this is good. to gain credibility, I would say first, usually what happens when you're designing something, right? On the current model, I would say you have a product owner that comes back to a development team, right? That has designers, researchers on them. I said, hey, you know what? I have spoke with my business. I know exactly what we do. And at that point in time, you start taking the requirements, right? So you not found the requirements and yeah, you have the order ready. You go back, uh, bring researchers, right? Not, not even researchers. At that point, you just bring a designer, start mocking up the solution, right? Come back to the product owner, show it, give the thumbs up, you start developing. And at that point in time, you say, oh, we should test it, right? It's like, yeah, great. Let's bring users to test. That is a failure. Usually those type of products, in my experience, meet the mark. 50% of, like when I say 50%, the futures on those projects are mid the mark 50, 60%, they are there, but always you will hear the client like something is missing or I thought that it will do ABC. So what we show to them is that instead of just working on the solution space, like the double diamond, we have to work on the problem space and they need to invest time in understanding what are the real problems, right? So that was a complete shift because people come to us and say, hey, we need to do usability testing on this. And we said, okay, uh, did you, to put it together, did you connect to any real end user? And the answer was no. Like, okay, uh, what about any feedback that you have collected, right? Instead of just jumping to usability testing, we're kind of going through what they currently have available. And the answer was no. So what we suggest because of the time effort between a usability testing and a service, like why we don't just run a simple survey? and get that feedback and take it from there. Uh, what do you recommend? We usually recommend SaaS service, SaaS course to baseline it. Yep. And then from there, it's like potentially we throw an open CSAT uh, feedback for me. If you work with me, you say, hey, let's get that feedback and try to put it on their face because there's what we go, we get what I call the golden nuggets. That's basically users telling you what's wrong and an opportunity. So that is basically what we send out with that. We say, hey, you know, you came to us showing this application and all these constraints and we get the feedback and they don't add up, they don't match, right? I, I will suggest you that we conduct um, a U, what we call a UX diagnostic. That is basically, we focus on the first diamond of the two diamond approach in the same thinking and we work on the, pro, on, on the problem space. So we understand usually the environment, we understand what the stakeholders think of the environment when they put together the rules, the artifacts. Then we talk to the end users and finally we basically analyze and, and create insights. Got so it. that is what we call a UX diagnostic. So that helped us pivot from this kind of, hey, um, you know, give me a designer. We have this, this yeah. thing that we want to create to, you know, uh, let's have a conversation. Uh, uh, people are willing to spend time to us helping understand the processes, the products, the UIs, right? The overall user experience and take it from there. So is either... A feedback collect, I would tell you, is either getting metrics, right, yeah. or getting some type of um, health check of what's going on. 
making them aware that uh, potentially some of their assumptions were right, but you need to double test it and then executing the work. And key, if you ask me, is that usually when we conduct these UX engagements, we try to spend between six to eight weeks with them and no more. So everything is hot. Is, and that, everything... all, is that all problem focused those six to eight weeks or is that problem? No, it depends where they are. To okay. be honest, okay. if they have basically, if they come to us and say, hey, I have this insight and they show that they have done the research and yep. they need us to iterate and prototype, we are there to support them. And in those cases, I would say it varies depending on the size of the uh, of the system that we are designing. But again, if you ask me, I will come to my team and say, hey, we need to be out of here in eight weeks, right? Um, usually that is kind of like, okay, we'll have two and a half months to execute it. Uh, but then from there, we come to a timeline that is constrained. And then what we do is basically we engage at the beginning, we get all their wish lists that I said. And then after a couple, I would say a couple, two or three weeks, we come back to them and say, hey, we need to scope this out. Right. And then we start kind of making them aware that, hey, this will take this. This was an assumption. Okay. This is a, like this is a wish. This is a, like a, this actually happened or, you know, we double check with them and from there we then repackage the engagement but again mark time is of the essence we try to keep it short and sweet so they see the results because the moment that we and this is fascinating right um we tend to like bring our sponsors to some of the research sessions so okay. we they are basically either hearing back an interview so they don't know who was kind of providing the answers and they're kind of you see their eyes right it's like their eyes open and they nod they start feeling the value right so what we do to keep them engaged we start sourcing them like little quotes of what the research has come to us we call uh we usually establish weekly checkpoints with them and we surface up this information right and that gives you a lot of credibility to a point that is like yeah you got it just Fantastic. after i would say the first three weeks that they saw us like the methodology i would say how the execution is on point um that we basically we don't just, I would say, have an open space. Say, yeah, let me take a look. We come to you with a with a scope, with a timeline, and we execute, try to execute on to that. And that will give us credibility for sure. Because just to wrap it up here, man. Um, usually with design, you never know exactly. You you can estimate how it'll take, but you know the devil's on the details. As as you finish your mockups, it's like oh, one more tweak and one more tweak yeah. and one more tweak, right? And then some of the things get pumped. So we need, uh, like, I ask my team to kind of pencils down at a certain point. It always be an improvement. Just do a parking, like a list of things that you can then come and pitch if you think could be refined. But we need to kind of timelines. Yeah, well, it gives the stakeholders constraints that they're going to kind of beholden to settle on their ideas. And then it actually makes planning easier you know people are only going to be engaged for a certain number of time and it's like from a process perspective makes a lot of sense so that credibility is first and foremost like gathering data and having the the capabilities in place to gather those metrics to measure the effectiveness output of the improvements to the user experience and then a lot you know switching a mindset of stakeholders from being solution focused to problem focused you got it yeah, fantastic. That's great. I feel like you Mark, you're a great synthesizer, my friend. No, I, I think you, just, you, taught, you taught a little bit of a masterclass in, I don't know, five minutes on, on I think, two great tenants that I think a lot of design teams, frankly, skip. Um, the, I don't, I honestly, it's an open question I have with, with, with folks is like the metric side of it, actually measuring the impact of our work seems like a really hard thing for a lot of groups to get established. But if, but if we want to have a, if designers want to have a seat at the quote unquote table and they want to be reporting into the C-suite, all of those folks, most organizations are making their decisions based on metrics. They're reporting out to their teams on a quarterly basis or the, the street or to board members, you know, investors on a quarterly basis. And if you mentioned CSAT and SUS, like if you can have this level of user satisfaction, you've put X amount of dollars of your budget into the UX team and it drove improvements in, you know, these areas. To me, it seems very logical, but it seems like it's such a hard thing to get started. Is, is BMS an analytical company? Like, was that just part of the culture? So it was easy. Did you all on the UX team have to like fight 
for the data side of the world? Like, and I know you said you come from an engineering background, so it was part of your kind of how you approach things, but do you have to push really hard for it? How did you get that? I, I guess, how did you get that wheel started? Because I think a lot of people are struggling to get the, the measurement wheel started. Now, uh, this is a really good question, Mark. Uh, I, th- I would say it's because of the ecosystem that we live in. I sit in, I, in the IT organization, right? And that was something that for me was like an, an opener when I started my career, right? I was an industrial engineer and then suddenly I saw technology be kind of the engine. And for me, that kind of pick up a lot of curiosity and I would say a passion to it because through technology, I was you were able to solve any type of problem, right? It was human effort plus technology and you will be there. In this IT organization, usually you have a lot of engineers, right? And I think one of the motives is what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. So establishing metrics, uh, assessing design was key. And you see how designers and basic product owners are pushing back because like, hey, it's, it's a, we usually get like, how many users answer the survey? This type of question is challenging the data, right? Yeah. But we keep kind of, hey, the numbers don't lie, these are the feedback. And for me, the overall score was just an indicator or a trend, again. I was pointing them to the information that the users provide to us. You see, so how coming to the message that, hey, let's hear what the user had to say. Let's work on that. And then use this number as a reference, not as to kind of judge you if it was good or bad, but it's something that could improve always, right? Yeah. Uh, gave, I would say, gave the adoption. But then also you get questions on the road like, okay, it's user experience or design is very subjective, right? How you th- how you see that is happening. So due to some efforts that we're doing, trying to improve uh, risk minimization strategies, that's for kind of severe side effects of drugs. I have gotten in touch into cognitive load. So if you ask me, it's like, hey, what it will be like a good design? I would say it has to be simple and intuitive. So it's like, what do you mean? It's like, use some good Gestalt principles and then uh, the users have to come to your design and try to use the less cognitive load or amount of conduct of possible to try to achieve what is meant to be done. And I was kind of, we were piloting um, some type, which survey we use to measure it, right? And that, if we reconnect, Mark, I'll tell you <laughs> how that goes, because I think that is the next, uh, like what, what we are tapping, because we need to ensure that in this case, the information that we're providing to a patient is they can consume it, right? And usually you see, yeah, it has to be at, I think it's a four grade level, but lecture level, but what exactly that means, right? And after that, my, if you ask me, what is my overall kind of uh, goal is to, after you consume this, what you can do next, right? So that next is something that uh, I haven't seen the solution yet, but that is basically, you see how the first user experience to consume information and then is yeah. in, execute something. So I, my team, we have been kind of getting together to see how we establish some metrics here. Fantastic. And yeah. That's great. I would love to connect further. Um, at the end, I'll give you an opportunity to, to um, you know, list out where people can find you and and uh, hopefully can follow along in, in that story as you guys tie that thread, not just of gathering data, providing information, but how you're enabling um, decision-making specifically, specifically with patients. I do want to switch slightly topics um, sure. because I noticed in perusing your LinkedIn profile, you've been with the COE for a number of years, but I think in maybe seven or eight months ago, something new got added to your title, which was accessibility. And you mentioned a certification that you're in the process of getting. Um, was that um, addition of accessibility personal interest on you that you wanted to tackle? Was it something that that Bristol Myers is like really advocating for? Is it just the general environment we're in? Because I don't, frankly, don't, uh, I, I sometimes see accessibility experts, but maybe not the threat of like, I, you know, UX lead and accessibility as kind of a focus. And, and I take titles in big organizations. Sometimes they, they're, it's like, you know, UX designer one or two, but, but when you're, you know, kind of at the level you are, it means something important to the business as they have accessibility in that title. So I'm kind of curious if you can uh, talk us through that change, what what it means, what's the importance of accessibility in tech in general, but also specifically you work in healthcare. So it's got uh, added uh, significance. Oh, like Mark, I would say, well, let me structure my answer because I'll be a little bit over the place. But <laughs> first and yeah. foremost, I, like BMS have uh, what we call core core behaviors. Inclusion is one of them. 
I am very grateful of the company. Um, I ha- like, I'm pretty sure most of you on a large company, what you have, what would they call M- employee affinity groups? We call people in business resource group. That is basically uh, groups for people who want to know, like who in- identify themselves as Latins or uh, Blacks or uh, Asian, you know? So in BMS, we have, I think six or seven of them. And I've been, since I joined the company, I was a member of what they call OLA, the Organization for Latino Achievement, right? And always bringing awareness uh, in STEM programs for Latinos in Central New Jersey colleges. We have a program that connects us and basically we are role models to them. And we come to schools and share our stories in Spanish or in English with the students and parents. I think that there are uh, between ninth and 11th grade that they are making their decisions for high schools or colleges, right? So we try to influence that and try to orient them to STEM. That, uh, I would say, that role exposed me to the other PBRGs. And we have another one that's called DON, that is focused on people with disabilities. We have been doing some work in inclusion. But then what happened is that on 2019 or 2020, one of what we call direct-to-consumer websites, those are the ones who support our marketing products, got into a lawsuit. And basically, the complaint was that the user, in this case, somebody with uh, so, uh, assistive tools, was not able to consume the information there, right? And we set, get into a settlement, but through that settlement, we get to kind of uh, the need of audit the website and bring the compliant to WCAG 2.1 AA standards. At that point in time, to be honest, we were like the COE was established and we define user experience, I recall, as a combination between usability and branding. Right. Mm. I think we were there because you uh, if you go back to BMS, we were updating our brand. So it was a good moment to kind of see, hey, uh, the brand team came. We uh, connect with them. We offer to be brand ambassadors because we were always interacting with internal teams that were putting together portals or applications so we can influence them to adopt the brand. Now, um, my CIO at that point in time came back to my VP and said, hey, we need to fix this and prevent that this happens again. Right. And that sent me in a journey, basically. The VP turns back and handed this over to me. And basically, it was kind of something that I, if you ask me at that point in time, accessibility was potentially color contrast, like things that, uh, yeah, and nothing like that, and nothing else, right? And we decided, without having too much kind of uh, insight, we said, okay, accessibility should be part of the equation. It's part of how people interact. So let's first define what is user experience for us. So if you come and talk to me, I would say user experience is the combination between usability and earnability, the classic kind of UX uh, things, branding and accessibility. So we basically make those, bring those three elements into kind of creating a good user experience. And then the change in the landscape, I think after COVID, the DOJ changed their focus on enforcement. They created, I think, uh, they called a task force to go after kind of, uh, at this point, if I'm wrong, they're working with online universities and COVID clinic sites, right? But they are checking their accessibility because through COVID, as you can imagine, um, with the lockdowns, there's a lot of people with disabilities that cannot go to the pharmacy or to regular places to get their services. They tried to go online and they fell miserably, right? And I would say um, web accessibility is in the, like, their beginnings. Um, it has been for a while. There's even rules here in the US in section 508 that if you do work for the government, you have to have your sites accessible. But it's not ubiquitous, right? It's not something that if you go and open most of the websites, you will find some issues while you try to go through them with a screen reader. Basically, that is kind of the main assistive tool with people with disabilities, right? Uh, so from there, what happened is, um, we decided that we need. Uh, there was a risk. We need to mitigate it. And at, at my company, we basically set up controls, and those controls need a process owner. So I'm fulfilling that role, and therefore the change, uh, like I would say, the inclusion of digital accessibility in the title. We were thinking to put something along inclusion, but it was it would be kind of a very very long title, and we want to make it evident that is around digital accessibility. And from there, what we did, uh, Mark, is basically we reach out, uh, we bring a vendor to help us conduct an audit. The vendor give us the audit and we say, hey, uh, do you have experience kind of setting things up so we prevent this? And they say, yeah. So we started working with them. And I recall that 
at some point in time, I'd say after we were with them working, I think we were four months, but at the second month, the solution that they were bringing to us was very reactive. They basically were saying, hey, on your development cycle, at the end, you put it like a check here, you check for digital accessibility, you find the issues and you ship back to your teams, right? And they have to fix it. It didn't make sense to me because when I was reading, I realized that there were issues with digital accessibility that were not in the development space, but they need to be like troubleshoot on the design space, right? Color, color, color combinations or color palette combinations that are render and accessible text or kind of patterns on the screen. So you see how this kind of, of kind of, I would say very reactive model didn't work. So I start reading, I stumbled upon from DQ. Uh, actually, we, I would say, I'm thankful that we stumbled upon them. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but- What was that, what group was it? DQ, okay. like Dairy Queen. I'm not right. from the US, but a lot of people told me that like, oh, Dairy Queen. like, no, 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 DQ, D-Q-U-E. They are the ones who support active tools that is an accessibility scan. I think if you talk to somebody, they will quote it. They will say, oh, we use a web aim or active tools. So they are the ones owning active tools. We, we work, like I engage them. Uh, I read this book that I think was published by their CTO. It was basically um, like, I would say, I don't recall the title, but it's things like agile, agile approach for digital accessibility, something out of those lines. But basically what they were preaching was, what I call a shift left approach. That was, yeah, you, in order to enable accessibility, you just not need to get a gate check at the end, checking, but you need to ensure that all the people that is putting together that solution or that capability or that platform, ensure that in each step, they account for digital accessibility, right? So for example, a website usually has the content, you have images, you have other resources like PDFs, multimedia, so if you decided that it needs to be accessible, the website itself needs to be accessible, but the artifacts on it, like PDFs, multimedia, uh -huh. needs to be accessible. So it's not only giving know-how and awareness of digital accessibility to the development teams, but also to the other stakeholders that are putting together that content for them. So you see how suddenly, in order to really get accessible solutions, you need to go at the beginning of this, right? Even shifting more left and to the procurement organization and say, hey, when we procure these services, we need to ensure that the company have skills on that or the platform that we bring in have out of the box components that are accessible, right? So you see how you finally are shifting left. So that has been the journey that we have embarked. And again, to answer your question, sorry, that was kind of quite a, quite a story there. For me is passion. Like I think inclusion, uh, I'm not from here. Uh, like I'm an immigrant and it was, I would say, not completely easy to get into the, I would say, working environment. And I have a lot of help and it was uh, help that I think uh, allowed me to be successful. So I'm trying to give it back. And with digital accessibility and the stories that you hear, and then when you start interacting with people with disabilities and the effort that they bring, the like their authenticity, how they want to be their own selves, right? and try not to get support by anybody, but troubleshoot and stuff like that. Give me passion, my friend. And that's something that I, I kind of, I have, if you ask me, uh, it has been two years that I have le been learning digital accessibility. I will not, uh, yeah, it has a lot, of, a lot of nuances, a lot of basically HTML code, ARIA code, but beyond that, then you really want to shift left. And then when you're designing, you change the, change completely your optics, right? It's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, one of the tips, if you don't mind, I can leave here is when you wanna make accessible solutions, try to convey the information in two ways, right? And usually we do a terrific job on multimedia. We tend to put captioning in them, even audio description, or there's a transcript available. I don't know if you live and live with Teams, but Teams have now live captioning, uh, you have the transcript, you know? But usually we, I would say we fall short in terms of charts and graphics, right? Mm -hmm. Think of people who are colorblind. We use a lot of color to convey values, right? On our charts, on our graphs. And that, that is not accessible, right? So as a designer, you need to kind of figure out how I make them accessible, right? And how these beautiful elements that have colors and a nice legend 
or like they need to kind of be, I would say, thrown away and brought something that I, I would say, it's not so appealing to your eyes because it has more things there. But at the end, if you think of the experience, you are enabling people to consume that, right? So your artifact will be fulfilling their purpose, right? With this extra, I would say, as the design was, you will say it's a lot more saturated, but is needed. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's um, wonderful to hear your journey and where it's taking you now. And what I would maybe say is like a new passion for accessibility um, is really incredible. I like the idea of of people shifting left, 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 and not just thinking there's a code scan we need to do at the end of this to make sure a screen reader can get through it. But it's it is a mentality change within organizations. It's a process change. It starts at the very beginning, and it. it you know, people say um, research isn't a phase. Research is something you should do the entire way. I think you can make the same analogy to say like accessibility isn't just a, a phase or a checkbox. Hey, we're going to do a visual, um, you know, check to make sure contrast ratio is on. We're going to do a tech check at the end with code, but that it should be a mentality that's that's sort of enabled and, and, and part of your process throughout. Correct. I think I was on a webinar that was accessibility is not a checklist and that was very real. And that is something that I would say, based on my journey, that's something that you have to demystify, right? Because the moment you come to somebody in IT, usually in the development space, well, yeah, give me a checklist of what I need to fulfill, right? Give me your guidelines. So it's like, yeah, I can give it to you, but then you, like here, you need to make an extra effort to understand what is the user experience that you want to convey, right? Because we have found websites that is basically print and fail. Usually you have stumbled upon those resources, print and fail, right? Yeah. And I recall my designer was like, this is not inclusive at all. It's like, oh yeah, you're right. right. And we went into a rabbit hole of trying to fix that PDF. I recall, it's like, hey, it needs to be accessible, you know, like down to the down to the task, without just you know follow our same, I would say, mantra and said, hey, let's understand the real problem here and then jump into solution. We jumped right away to solution. I recall the first time, like, hey, we need to remediate PDF, and PDF remediation is a madness. I don't know like Mark, if you have been exposed, but a while. it's one of the, I would say one of the biggest efforts, like it's more complicated than remediate a website. I would say a simple website, if it's not transactional, it's much mm -hmm. more complicated. So I would say we spent easily like three weeks effort of a resource there, wow. right? Just remediating to then realize that, oh, the call out in the website needs to change. And we need to say, like download and fill and upload again, you know, those yeah. little tweaks. And that is this whole shift left mentality. Right. And a lot of awareness, Mark, a yeah. lot of awareness. Right, the checklist think... wouldn't have got you there. No, right? at all. It, it would have passed that checklist. It will, you will pass the checklist with yeah. kind of high scores, but then you will you will put it on production. The patient will come and it's like, Fantastic. it's like, okay, uh, I, I don't know. Like I use my, my keyboard. I don't like, I, yeah. I'm not sighted. I cannot handwrite, right? So, yeah. and that mark, just to wrap it up, I think is something that I will leave here for designers and teams like awareness. That is, I think um, everybody's a designer. I will usually start conversations like that with my stakeholders say, hey, yeah, the moment that you wake up, you go to your closet, you pick your clothes, you're designing for yourself, right? You're designing how you will look like. People who had figured it out, I, I don't know if you have read it, but I think Einstein was the one who had like one color or already like the same suit every time so he doesn't have to invest energy on that but you see how you're investing energy you're making an effort to kind of pick and choose your course so everybody's not designing and also nowadays software has made design i would say universal right you come to any type of software and you can drag and drop things and you can put together a, a, a ui right yep. i have <laughs> the opportunity to work with very smart people that come to us and say hey i can code it for you i can do it for you right i was like yeah but there's that's why people go to college also get educated because design is a science for me it's an art it's an art with a science right yep. and therefore you need to be able to not only present the ui but explain why you make certain design choices right and articulate them with some out what i tell my team fancy words that will give you credibility right so i point them to get up principles i am a big fan of jablonski i don't know if you have read mm -hmm. them Law, laws of ux we have their cards. Every time we need to kind of sell, I would say, you know, you need to sell the car, go get a couple of cards, find the ones that apply to you, go and pitch them to the client, right? Therefore, there is not like somebody saying, hey, yeah, this looks nice, you know, and they didn't take too much time. 
but you can say they didn't took, they take too much time because we use Gesture's principles to bring the information closer. We put the CTA next to their line of sight. So, you know, you just don't, you need to walk them through your design decisions with some, I would say, criteria that uh, give you credibility. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I think um, it's a good uh, thread or tie into where we started around establishing credibility. Um, appreciate you walking us through the journey of the the COE and your personal journey into your new passion. Well, now two years, so not that new, but renewed passion in in sort of accessibility. And then that sense of of how designers need to to communicate their designs is not just about the designs, how you communicate it, and sort of establishing credibility. So um, I really appreciate it. I know the listeners are going to really appreciate your your journey and and thoughts. As I said in the middle there, you gave a little masterclass on on how to organize a, a, a COE within a within a um, and get success within a C, uh, of a COE within a large organization. People want to find you um, LinkedIn, Twitter, any any URLs people can hit. Oh yeah, I uh, look into. I'm not. Big in Twitter, I would say. Um, not big on social media. I need to pick up my game, I think, on LinkedIn. But you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my first name and last name. It's awesome. where you can find me. Uh, probably my picture is there. Great. So, yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, and then I think uh, we I can give you my Gmail. If that's uh, We can put it on Yeah, the, I can put it in uh, when we post. I'll um, put your a link to your... Um... To your LinkedIn and uh, and your email address if people want to reach out. Appreciate you including that information. In terms of oh, definitely, my friend. Yeah, I'm more than glad to connect. Because... Yeah, thank you so much for your time and ideas and sharing your process and and thoughts. I really appreciated it. Your passion for design and accessibility comes out so much appreciated. Thank you for the opportunity, Mark. Uh, looking forward to connect again uh, to see how that little experiment work out. I think uh, for the designers, researchers out there, guys, try always to be inquisitive. Try always to be kind of to bring something new to the game. That is, I think, our role as researchers or designers. Try to test test things out. Don't lose that, even if you don't get buy-in, but just keep coming back until you, you will get buy-in. And if you find the right people, try to use them as your poster child for good work and then use them to kind of elevate you, elevate the message and improve, I would say, the user experience because that is our job here, right? To ensure that everybody could have the same experience when they are interacting with our products or what we have created. Fantastic. Thanks for, for ending on a, on a little bit more advice for, for our listeners. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Mark. All right. Take care. You too. Have a great day, guys. Bye.